late for your meeting. What is my schedule? You're due at the hospital in an hour, and Thomas Shea is cooling his heels in your office. No good. Let him. I don't think the most powerful attorney in the city likes to be kept waiting. Well, Mr. Shea tends to forget he works for us. Sister Margaret, you are becoming dangerously indispensable. I'm going to requisition you from the Archbishop. The young nun is getting him. I still don't understand why you couldn't handle this by yourself. Well, Father O'Neill's asking some questions I couldn't answer. What kind of question? About our real estate dealings for the church. You handled most of the transactions yourself. Just who is this priest? They brought him in for an independent audit. He's, I hear he's already cleaned house in two dioceses. New accountants, new lawyers. Our firm has represented the church for over two decades. And I expect we'll be here long after he's gone. Ah. Father O'Neill, <laughs> I've heard so much about you. Nice to finally meet you, Mr. Shea. Mr. Bradley? Father, excuse me. I'm sorry to seem so elusive. I've been tied up on other matters. I see. Well, considering all the money we're paying, I'd have thought the church's affairs would come first. Hmm? Please. Good morning, Father. Well. How's it going with Father O'Neill? You keeping up with him? Well, right now I have to get over to the archives at the convent, and then I have to come back here to get some clarifications on the Archdiocese books before we leave for the hospital, and that's just this morning. Mm -hmm. You should be taking your final vows pretty soon. In two months. The church needs people like you. You keep us on our toes. Thank you, Father. Well, it's time to go. Someone has got to answer the Archbishop's phone. <laughs> Give my regards to the Archbishop. And remind him he owes me a dinner. I would like to review those partnership agreements on Monday. And so you will. Goodbye, Father. Thank you. Well, Monsignor, is the Archbishop in? He's off for the day with an old friend. Can I do anything for you? No. No, I don't think so. Father O'Neill. If you wish to discuss diocese business affairs, you talk to me. I talk to the Archbishop. The Archbishop asked me to report directly to him. Unfortunately, he is not available, and I am his financial director. I'm sorry. I'd rather wait till he gets back. Father, the hospital. Thank you. Excuse us. Well, we're early for a change. Maybe I'll make a few calls. Oh, no, no. I'm taking you to the cafeteria. You'll forget to eat lunch again. Have you become responsible for my care and feeding as well? Somebody has to be. You obviously can't do it for yourself. Sister, sister, anyone ever tell you you are impertinent? Lots of people. Father Come O'Neill. on. Yes. I understand you requisitioned some files from my office without my permission. Dr. Lattimore, I don't think this is the time or the place to discuss it. It's as good a time as any. Fine. Doctor, how you treat your patients, well, that's your business. But how you run this hospital, that's mine. Look, Father O'Neill, you want something from me. Just ask me. I did. Several times. Excuse us. Sister? What was that about? Uh, he's incorrigible. He's supposed to be a great doctor. And the worst chief of medicine any hospital ever had. He's autocratic, insulting. Because of him, all the best doctors are leaving. Well, it certainly wasn't very charming to you. Well, at least with me, he has an excuse. He knows I'm going to recommend he be removed. How was that? Marginal. You have those budgets the uh, hospital administrator sent over? Yes, I have them right here. Mm-hmm. Ow. Oh. 
Oh, let me see that. Ooh. It's just a paper cut. I think it'll be okay. Does it hurt? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, Father O'Neill, I uh, tried to reach you at your office. We left early. Is there a problem? Well, I couldn't get the accounts receivable you requested. Mrs. Cartwright, you're the administrator of this hospital. Can't you get me a simple piece of information? I'm sorry, but the computer went down. I'll have it in the next day or two. Well, no point in meeting until then. Good day. Get a blood pressure and a pulse. What happened? I, uh, we were taking a walk. I, um, uh, I sort of collapsed. The nurse will get your vital signs. I'll be right back. You can't stay here. I want to stay with my friend. Your Grace. Your what? Oh, John, haven't you met the Archbishop? Oh, great. I'll get the doctor. I don't believe it. Father O'Neill actually gave you time off. Father O'Neill is very dedicated. I don't know where you find the strength. They're teaching her patience. Mm, I call it endurance. It's like a marathon with Father O'Neill. She's young and aging fast. The man's a workaholic. I rather like it. Maybe you just like him. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, come on, Margaret. You can tell us. Tell you what? Tell us about you and Father O'Neill. I think you ought to mind your own business. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. No problem. Mr. Eastman, I've been going over the Archdiocese books. How long has your firm been our accountants? Oh, nine years. What's the occasion? None that I know of. Well, it's the best kind of gift, a surprise. Hmm. Very handsome. Would you excuse me? Oh, Father Chris? Have you seen Sister Margaret? Not this morning, Father. Look what she gave me. I must tell you, there has been some talk. Perhaps you two have been working too closely together. I've got to put a stop to this right now. Tom, don't be too hard on her. Good morning, Father. Could you please explain this to me? I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Why did you give me this gift? I didn't give you a gift. There's a card. Oh, my love, Mark. I didn't write this. This isn't even my handwriting. Well, who wrote it then? Who else knows I always borrow your pen? Are you saying that I'm lying, Father? Do you have any idea who might have put this in my office? I don't know. I'm afraid people are getting the wrong idea about us. Maybe, maybe it would be simpler if we stopped. 
working together. We haven't done anything wrong. Margaret, what if someone is trying to discredit me? In my work with the church, I can't afford even the slightest hint of impropriety. Father, we shouldn't let this change anything. It's not fair. Well, think about it. Oh, Mr. Eastman's been waiting long enough. Is there anything I can do? We'll talk later. Like I could ski down Mount Whitney. He never could catch up to me. That's what? true. But I could play gin. Gin. Oh. Ouch! Oh. How was your flight? Perry, I was worried to death about you. They told me you collapsed from exhaustion. I rushed here from the airport. I didn't even go to the hotel. I'm the one to blame, Della. You see, a few weeks ago, I brought in a priest, a troubleshooter, to look into the archdiocese's financial affairs. I haven't gotten the final report yet, but he's certain there's embezzlement in this hospital. Stephen asked me to help investigate. Several of his close advisors may be involved. Your secret would have been very safe with me. Sorry for the deception, Della. For the moment, I uh, want to stay undercover. <laughs> Very clever. You think so? Tomorrow we go to work. We'll begin by meeting with your father, O'Neill. Well, I must be going. Hey, when do I get the $16 you lost? When we finish the game. Not before. Good to see you again, Stephen. Stephen! The food here had better be good. Miracles do happen. About you. I've known that man 42 years. I've never seen him like this. It's that serious. Everything he's worked for is on the line. Hello? Of course, Father. One moment. Sister Margaret, it's for you. It's Father O'Neill. Yes, Father? Sister Margaret. I want you to come over to my hotel. Have you thought about what we discussed this afternoon? Well, you'll never mind that. Just come over. Right away. You don't have to raise your voice to me, Father. I'll be there as soon as I can. Thank you. step out for a moment. I'm Richard Logan. Come in, please. Thank you, Father. He'll be back right away. Uh, would you care for something to drink? There's sherry. Don't I know you? No, I don't think so. Would you like some? Yes, thank you.
Are you in this diocese, Father? No, I'm at the Church of St. Virgil. I stop by the Archbishop's office when I'm in the city. And you're a friend of Father O'Neill's? No. Not really. feel very well. Is something wrong? I feel, I feel very dizzy. What, what are you doing? No! Stop! Good night, sister. Let me help you. I'm okay. I'm okay. Are you, you sure? Yes. Sit down. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Father O'Neill. Say this Father Logan gave you a glass of sherry. That's right. <laughs> Sister, we've been through this suite several times and no sign of your glass. In fact, we can't even find a bottle of sherry. Maybe he took it. I don't know. Uh, let's get May I ask you something else, Sister? Have you ever blacked out before? Do you have any sort of medical history? No. My sister Margaret. And how did you say you ripped your jacket? He tore it. Are you all right, my child? Um, Archbishop Carl, this is Sergeant Brock. Oh. Oh, can you tell me what happened? There really isn't much to tell. It appears Father O'Neill was stabbed sometime late last night. Do you have any idea who did it? Not yet. Is she free to go? Well, we really have a few more. Sergeant Brock, I think she's been through enough. Of course. Thank you. Archbishop, I'm looking for Father Richard Logan. Sister Margaret says he's at the Church of St. Virgil. Have you heard of the man? Give my office a call. You shouldn't be too hard to find. Thank you. Margaret is certainly going to be the prime suspect. I am concerned for her. You have good reason to be. Either she killed Father O'Neill or this Logan did, and I suspect the police aren't going to find him. Perry, the press smells a scandal. 
I, uh, I'm embarrassed to ask. Then don't. You'd better see if you can get hold of Paul. And just what do you want me to tell him? Tell him to get here yesterday. I'd like to meet your sister, Margaret. I thought you'd never ask. Margaret! I'd like you to meet some old friends of mine, Perry Mason and Della Street. I heal quickly. Runs in the family. Father O'Neill was such a good man. Why would somebody murder him? I don't know. It's so unfair. You cared for him a great deal. Yes. We distributed a sketch of Father Logan all over the city this morning. And that includes parochial schools, churches, convents, rectories, every Catholic institution from here to the suburbs. And we showed it to all the guests and help at Father O'Neill's hotel. Sir? I'm listening. No one has recognized as Father Logan. No one has ever seen him before. And there's not one single shred of evidence to show that this Father Logan was ever in Father O'Neill's room. You think Sister Margaret is lying? I don't think that there is a Father Logan. Never was. And several witnesses have suggested that Sister Margaret was uh, close to Father O'Neill. And by that you mean... She had a romantic attachment to him, sir. That's absurd. I baptized the girl. I've known her since she was a child. Sergeant Brock, Margaret wouldn't lie, and she wouldn't break her vows. Archbishop... I'm going to have to conduct a search of her room at the convent, sir. By what authority? I have a warrant. I would have thought you'd have the courtesy to inform Sister Margaret. Thank you for your advice, Sister. We'll take it from here. I'll be in my office if you need me. Thank you, Sister. this one nailed. My dear Margaret. <laughs> the cab is downstairs. Good. We mustn't keep the Archbishop waiting. Sister Margaret, I'm afraid you'll have to come downtown with us. What's the problem? Who are you? The name's Mason. What do you want with Sister Margaret? We found Father O'Neill's letter in your room. What letter? I, n I never got a letter from him. And who gave you the right to go through my room? We had a warrant, Sister. Why don't we step in here? Now, where is this letter? I have a copy of it here. May I see it? I'll read it to you. My dear Margaret, I fear we have been compromised and risk ruining our careers. He never sent me a letter like that. Let him finish. We'll both be better off if we put an end to it now and don't see each other again. I'm sorry you deserve better than to sign Tom. Mr. Mason, you have to believe me. How do you know that's from him? Oh, it's his, all right. We ran a handwriting comparison. That letter, 
It's about our working together, but he never gave that to me. Sister Margaret, I don't think there is a father, Logan. He was there. And I swear to you, he was there. I don't think so. Why not? Because I think that she was in love with Father O'Neill. That is not true. We have this letter. You were seen holding hands. There was a lover's quarrel over a gift, and he ended your affair. There was never any affair. Sister Margaret, I think that you went up to his room, and I think you went up there to plead with him not to end it. I think maybe there was a moment between you two, and then you blacked out. But you blacked out after you killed him. That was not what happened. That's enough, Sergeant. Sir, we have her fingerprints on the knife that was used to kill Father O'Neill. Someone could have put the knife in her hand after she blacked out. Sister Margaret, I'm placing you under arrest for the murder of Father Thomas O'Neill. You have the right to remain I'll silent. I'll advise her of her rights. Are you her attorney, sir? I am now. Your Honor, defendant waives further reading of the complaint and advisement of constitutional rights. We enter a plea of not guilty. Your Honor, the state requests a preliminary hearing at the court's earliest possible convenience. Mr. Mason? Defense concurs. Thank you, gentlemen. This matter will be set for December 10 at 9 a.m. The court has recessed 15 minutes. All rise. Mr. Mason? Michael Rustin. Possibly you remember I appeared before you in appellate court. Yes. You made a very impressive argument. Flatter, do you remember? This uh, case, a delicate matter, especially for my client. Mr. Mason, you have a reputation for not cutting any deals. I'll see you on the 10th. How good is he? Very. Where's Paul? I'm meeting him at the airport at 11. Good. Bring him straight to Stefan's office. He's fine. We're going to meet him downtown. Well, wait a minute. Your message said he collapsed. He was in a hospital. Well, actually, he's just fine. You must be pretty sick. What am I doing here, Della? Well, there's a case and... A case? You've heard of Stephanie Harris, the most beautiful model in the history of California? Her father was paying me to accompany her to Tahiti. Now Howard Burton is in paradise and I am here on freezing. Will you please get in? What is this case? Well, there's a nun. A nun? Yes. I'll fill you in on the way. Get in. Terrific. Yes? Well, send them in. Hello. Hello. Archbishop Coro, Sister Margaret, I'd like for you to meet our private investigator, Paul Drake. How do you do? How do you do? Hello. Hello. Hi. Aren't you cold? I left in something of a hurry. You'd better get some warm clothes before you catch pneumonia. Good idea. You went over the case with Della. Oh, yes. I'd like you to start looking for a Father Logan. Sister Margaret can give you what little information we have. The police haven't found any trace of him. Well, maybe we can. Is there any place I can get a cup of coffee around here? At the convent. Well, would you care to join me? I'm buying. Excuse me. Excuse us. This is the police artist sketch of Father Logan. Fairly accurate? Yes. Anything else? Scars, birthmarks? 
No. Mm -hmm. Anything peculiar that this guest doesn't show? Like what? Did he uh, pull his ear, scratch his head, uh, have any habits or something strange? Anything about him that struck you was uh, kind of odd. No. No, I don't think so. No. No, I knew I'd seen him before. It was in here. It was in the cafeteria, and he was... He was sitting right over there. And he was folding his matches. So? You asked if he'd done anything strange. He had a nervous habit. He lit a cigarette, and then he folded down all the matches in his matchbook. And I think he threw them away. He did that here? Yes. When? A few days ago. When do they collect the trash? This is what detective work is all about. Following the trail, finding the clues, and getting very dirty. You really like this kind of work? Well, it, uh, it could be worse. How? Just thank the man upstairs. This is only a couple days' worth of garbage here. Paul, I don't even know if Logan threw the matches away. And even if he did, they could come from anywhere. Tell you what, why don't you, why don't you pray for me, huh? Why don't you talk to me? What, uh... Sister Margaret? Something I said? With all due respect to my eminent colleague, I object to Mr. Mason representing Sister Margaret. Would you prefer local counsel? I don't think you understand the issues here, Mr. Mason. This is a scandal. And I, for one, don't want it to touch the Archbishop or the Church. Sir, Mr. Mason is your friend. As long as he represents Sister Margaret, you are personally associated with her defense. I agree completely. I made a commitment to Sister Margaret, and I intend to fulfill it. In any case, there's no avoiding the scandal. We are under no obligation to defend her. We can cut our losses. Just a minute. Why do you assume she's guilty? Well, the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming. But that's all it is. Circumstantial. Let's assume for a moment that Margaret is innocent. Why then does someone dress as a priest and kill Father O'Neill? Well, he could be a... Uh, he could be a psychopath. Perhaps. Or it could have something to do with Father O'Neill's investigation of the church affairs. He was investigating us. I know. I'll need access to Father O'Neill's papers. The church's affairs are confidential. There is no other way to give Sister Margaret a proper defense, and I intend to do that, even if it requires a subpoena for every single one of you. That won't be necessary. A girl's life is at stake. We will cooperate in every way. Archbishop, we simply want to protect your reputation. I think it is in excellent hands. You need help. Now, what, uh... What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? This is something that I always felt I must do. Yeah? You happy here? Mm-hmm. Sister Margaret, may I ask you something of a personal nature? Sure. Did you ever date when you were younger? A little. Did I miss it? I find great comfort in the church. Well, <clears throat> that's a shame. What do you mean by that? Well, oh, I, ju I just meant that uh, you're very pretty, I think quite bright, and I uh, would guess there's a lot of young men out there who would find you very appealing. That's all. Well, Mr. Drake, I'll take that as a compliment. Well, please do. 
And while you're at it, take a look at this. What do you think? That's the way he folded them. You sure? I saw him do it in the cafeteria and at the hotel. Where are they from? The Westlake Health Club. Time for me to work out. Mr. Mason asked me to bring you this. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Perfect, eh? Any sign of Logan? Not yet. Margaret, you better go. Don't you want some company? I'm trying to be inconspicuous. Having you here doesn't help. I'm the one who can recognize him. I can do that from the picture. I think it would be a good idea if I stayed. Margaret, please. I want you to stay here. I thought I asked you to wait outside. This is no time to argue. Excuse me, a guy came in wearing a black jacket. Where is it? Probably changing. Over there. Stay. Where you going, sister? I'm with him. Come back here. Hey, hey, hey. What are you? Crazy? Hey, hey, hey. Come on, get out. 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 Get four times a week. Did you ever see him with anyone? Did he have any friends? Drake, I'm not keeping you away from anything, am I? No. How long has he been a member here? Six months. Six months. That means this man must have been a resident. Go away, Drake. What? Go away. Oh. All right. Well, I'm going to be right over here if you need me. Please. Perry. The man we call Logan was registered here under the name of McGrath. Unfortunately, it appears that the name is a phony. So's the address. At least we know he exists. And knows we're looking for him. Well, you certainly were chasing someone that looked like this. This is the man who said he was Father Logan. Yeah, but I got nothing to tie him into the murder. You certainly can't arrest a man for running through a health club. Sergeant, I swear to you, he was in that room. Well, okay. I'm done here. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Well, we've got to place Logan at the scene of the crime. Go over the police file in the morning, double-check their interviews with everyone at the hotel. Consider it done. Another couple of washings. That sweater might fit. Yeah. <clears throat> Me too. 
What time are you picking me up in the morning? I didn't know I was. Do you want me to go with you? I don't think so. You were right. I shouldn't have followed you into the health club. And I said I was sorry. Look, 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 sister, I don't want to get into this, all right? It's late. I'm wet. We're both tired. I'll keep you informed. Good night. I don't like your patronizing attitude. I am not being patronizing. You know I could be of some help. I can manage. And you're not very forgiving. And you are the most irritating nun I have ever met. As a matter of fact, you are the only irritating nun I have ever met. Maybe you could work on correcting that. Good night. There was a card. It was attached to the gift that Father O'Neill found on his desk. And I'm sure that he filed it away somewhere. Mm -hmm. It isn't worth getting upset over. Well, it wasn't my handwriting. And he, he thought that someone might be trying to discredit him. I don't know where it's going. Margaret. Margaret? It's not going to get any easier. Mm -hmm. mm. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning We've been organizing some of Father O'Neill's papers. This is the hospital budget. And here are the preliminary reports on the real estate holdings. I'd like you to set up appointments with everyone Father O'Neill questioned. I wasn't present at all of his meetings. Well, whatever you can recall, give to Della. Where's Paul? Out solving this case single-handedly. He, uh, he went to buy some clothes, and then he was going to go see the police. Sister, see if you can find Monsignor Kaiser. I need to talk with him. Did something happen between Sister Margaret and Paul? I don't know. You worried about her? <sighs> yes. So am I. You know what? Mason's got me here until I satisfy him. The case is hopeless and he lets me go home. Come on, be a sport. Let me look at the case file so I can get out of here. I have 56 open cases to work on. I don't have time to be monkeying around with you. Let me put it another way. I could be gone inside of a week. That is the best offer I have heard all day. A week. Thank you. Monsignor Kaiser, we were looking for you. Yeah, and here I am. Possibly you were searching for Father O'Neill's recommendation. Actually, I need the disbursement file. You mean this? Yes, thank you. Were you aware of Father O'Neill? was going to recommend that you be replaced? No, I didn't know that. It's no secret you weren't pleased that he was here. Who told you that? Was it because he reported directly to the Archbishop? Mr. Mason, the man was an opportunist. He was brought here for a simple audit and he turned it into an inquisition. I understand you left a successful business career to join the church. I came here because I felt that my talents would be appreciated and I could work on something I believed in. So being removed from this position would be a terrible blow. Tell me, Monsignor,
What would you have done if you had found this recommendation? Mr. Mason, I deeply resent your implications. I don't blame you. Good day, sir. Peter? Peter. What's the matter? Monsignor Kaiser just called. He said this, this Mason fellow's taking up where only you left off. Ellen, calm down. Peter, I'm scared. Come with me. Look, I don't have much time. Mason's going to be here any second to see me. About what? What are you going to say to him? Ellen, for God's sake, pull yourself together. I'm not going to implicate you. We're in this together. Well, got to see you tonight. No, I can't. Carol's giving one of her parties. Well, tell her it's an emergency. Dr. Lattimore. I... I didn't mean to intrude. The nurse told me you were here. Uh, I'd like you to meet our administrator, Ellen Cartwright. How do you do? Nice to meet you. Um, I was just leaving. Thank you. So, how are you feeling? And never better. Your recuperative powers are amazing. It runs in the family. Well, I wish I could help you with Sister Margaret's defense. I've always liked her. Perhaps you can. I gather Father O'Neill felt the quality of medicine had fallen under your tenure. What did Father O'Neill know about the quality of medicine? He seemed to think you were driving good doctors away. That's ridiculous. Look, I'm not the problem. Go on. Well, you're going to find us out anyway. This hospital is habitually short of equipment and supplies. That's why those doctors left. There's never enough money. There's never enough money. The person in charge of the physical operation of the hospital is Mrs. Cartwright, is it not? That's right. And under the circumstances, I think Mrs. Cartwright is doing a terrific job. Under the circumstances, I'd be surprised if you didn't. I checked into the hotel around Tampa. So you did not see this man dressed as a priest go into the hotel? I already told the police everything I know. This will just take a second. I have a dozen people I want to see, and I'm running late. I didn't see any priests anywhere. Mr. Ellison, you live in Bayport. That's 15 minutes out of town, right? Right. Why didn't you go home? Well, to tell you the truth, I had too much to drink. I went to a party, and I didn't want to drive home. By the way, the night clerk said you checked in with your wife. Well, yeah, but she didn't see anything. I'd like to talk with her. I don't think she can help. Why? I already asked her. You'd be wasting your time. Well, you never know. Maybe I can uh, jog her memory. What's the number? <sighs> Look, I told you she didn't see anything. Mr. Allison, were you with your wife at the hotel? I think you'd better leave. Operator, yes, the number in Bayport for a Mr. and Mrs. Ellison, please. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? Thank you. I said leave. It's ringing. I saw your priest. Look, my wife finds out what I was up to, she'll kill me. We'll keep you out of it. My friend and I were coming into the back entrance of the hotel. This priest gets out of a red and white cab, follows us in. You don't see priests sneaking in and out of hotels very often. We thought it was funny. Did you see him go upstairs, go into a room? I saw him get out of the cab and come in. That's it. That's enough. Logan was seen arriving at the Mayfair Hotel in a cab. Have you spoken to the dispatcher? For a small sum, which I'm sure you'll reimburse me for at a later date. He gave me the name of the driver. I know where to look for him this afternoon. Oh, well, we need Logan. I'll find him, I'll find him. What did uh, you come up with? Well, we've been over the hospital records. The good father was correct. Someone is stealing them blind. You're late for your meeting. No hat? 
No kiss? Paul. Oh. <laughs> Let me take a look. Here you go. Where's Sister Margaret? She's in church. Well, good. Good. How is she? She could use a friend, Paul. Why are you looking at me? What happened between you two? Nothing. Well, I don't know what it was, but she's very upset. You know, everyone around here is shunning her. She's alone, Paul, and she's scared. I got a new lead on Logan. It's good. You don't seem very excited. I'm sorry. I, I think I just have other things on my mind right now. Margaret, you're on trial for murder. What could be more important than that? You wouldn't understand. Try me. How would you feel if you had spent six years of your life preparing for something and then you didn't know if it was right? There's a name for that. It's called cold feet. It's not that. What is it then? I don't know if I can take my final vows. Why not? I've never admitted this to anyone before. But I was attracted to Father O'Neill. And I tried not to be. I couldn't help myself. I, I couldn't control myself, Paul. And I don't know if I'm fit to be a nun. Margaret. You're a human being. You, you have feelings for... Like everybody else. There are higher standards of conduct in the church. And I've failed them. You're being too hard on yourself, Margaret. I don't know. Maybe it's me. I I can't live with these doubts anymore, and I have to I have to find a way to prove myself. Well, I'm sure if anybody can, you can. Do you really think so? Margaret, you are the most obstinate woman I have ever met. <laughs> and I have no doubt that whatever you set your mind to, you can do. Come on, buy your lunch. Mm. Experience in real estate seems to have served you well. Actually, I built this place. I wasn't referring to your house. Mr. Mason. Good, you're here. I uh, wanted to go over some of the real estate transactions that have been made for the church. I thought you might have something to add. Anything specific? Yes. Possibly you could explain this to me. Mr. Mason, for every property I've sold at a loss, I can show you ten that were profitable to the church. That isn't the point, Mr. Shea. 
I can make a strong case that you've systematically sold off the church's most valuable properties to your clients and associates. Nothing illegal about selling property to people I know. At the very least, your ethics could be questioned. What about you, Mr. Eastman? You were the accountant for the church at the time of all these transactions. Weren't you supposed to be guarding the church's interest? We're an accounting firm. We're not investment counselor. Mr. Mason, is this the best you can do in defense of this nun? <laughs> Mr. Shea, what would happen to your law firm if the church accused you of fraud? I won't dignify a question like that with a reply. I can understand why, Counselor. Della told me you found Logan. Cab driver said he picked him up right over there. Perry, this is no place for you. There's no place for either of us. Your timing's perfect. There he is. Excuse me. Why did we have to wait over 20 minutes for you to arrive? We were busy. With that outfit, waiting 20 minutes is nothing. Why don't they do something about it? The hospital's got an exclusive contract with this ambulance service. In my humble opinion, they haven't got the men or the vehicles to do the job. But the hospital won't change companies. You're very lucky. Here, hold that. It's just a flesh wound. Do you feel weak? No. Why? You lost some blood. What happened? Somebody took a shot in the dark. Did you see who? No. How is he, Doctor? He's going to be just fine. I'll have the nurse bandage him up. You all right? Yeah, fine. The, uh, the good doctor wanted to know if I saw who shot me. Really? Well, now that Logan is dead, what do we do? 
You can start by finding out who owns that ambulance service. I'm going to find out what's in this syringe. find out who owns the Centurion Ambulance Service. Can I sue? What? The leg. Oh, oh, no, I'm, uh... <clears throat> I'm in kind of a hurry. Clock me. seconds. I'm very impressed. I've done better. Is that right? Huh. You got what you want? Looks like some kind of holding company. Thank you. You've been cooperative, quick, and courteous. What's your name? Oliver Latham. Oliver. How do you do? Listen, do you have a card? Because I might have a few more questions I want answered, and I know I can trust them to you. Oliver, thank you very much. Could you describe the defendant's condition when you arrived at the hotel? She appeared to be upset. What about her physical condition? Well, her jacket was ripped. Did she say anything to you? Yes. Did you explain her constitutional rights to her? I don't feel it was necessary at the time, you see. Uh, she wasn't uh, a suspect then. She was not? No. What did she say to you at that time? She said that she had arrived the night before. She met Father Logan. He gave her some sherry. She became drowsy. She fell asleep. She was on the floor when the waiter arrived. They discovered Father O'Neill's body. During your subsequent investigation, did you discover anyone else besides the defendant who actually saw this Father Logan at the hotel? No, I did not. Uh, during the investigation of the room, did you find a bottle of sherry or a glass? No, I did not. Hello. Oh, may I help you? Oliver Latham, State Department of Corporations. Is there a problem? Our records show you failed to make your annual filings. Statements of current ownerships, Form 1001C and 902A, should have reached our office two months ago. Well, I think you're mistaken. Our administrator is very prompt about matters like that. Well, we didn't receive them. If you sent them, I certainly hope you have duplicates on hand. Well, I'm sure we do. I'll have to talk to the administrator. If you could just wait a minute. All right. I show you now People's Exhibit 3, and I ask you if you recognize it. So do it. That's the kitchen knife that's found in Paul O'Neill's suite. It has been stipulated by both Mr. Mason and myself that this knife was, in fact, the murder weapon. Were fingerprint tests run on this knife? Yes. One set of prints were found, a defendant's. Thank you. I have shown counsel, and I am now showing you a letter marked People's Exhibit 4 for identification. I ask you if you recognize this. Yes, that's the letter seized during the course of a search of the defendant's room. It has been stipulated that this letter was written by the decedent. Will you read the letter into the record, please? The letter says, my dear Margaret, I fear we have been compromised 
and risk ruining our careers. We'll both be better off if we put an end to it now and don't see each other again. I'm sorry. You deserve better. And to sign, Tom. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Your witness? Sergeant Brock, you personally saw the body of the man Sister Margaret identified as Father Logan? Yes, I did. No further questions. Drake! What do you think you're doing? let you do this i have to testify absolutely not mr mason i must reston will go after you he'll do whatever he can to make you lose your temper it'll be all right no it won't be all right if you give in to his provocation i'm sorry i have to do this margaret listen to me brock's testimony hurt you we can't take the risk mr mason i know how hard you've worked and please understand, this has nothing to do with the trial. What are you saying? I have studied to be a nun for six years. And if I'm not equal to this test, I don't deserve to take my final vows. It's a question of faith. Sister Margaret, are you testifying of your own free will and volition? Yes, sir, I am. And would you please tell this court why you chose to be a witness? I wanted everybody to hear the truth from me. Then I ask you for once and all time, did you or did you not murder Father Thomas O'Neill? No, sir, I did not. Thank you. Your witness. Sister Margaret, don't most priests live at the rectory? Yes. So by staying at a hotel, wasn't it easier for Father O'Neill to see you? Well, that's not why he lived Yes or no? Sister Margaret, wasn't it easier for Father O'Neill to see you? Yes. And in point of fact, on the night of the murder, didn't Father O'Neill call you and tell you to come to his hotel room? Yes, he did. Had you been there before? Several times. Yes, exactly how many times? Uh, once, twice? Four or five. Had you ever been to his room at such a late hour before? No. And yet you thought nothing of going? No. Hmm. Sister Margaret, how did you feel about Father O'Neill? Did you like him? Yes. Did you find him attractive? Your Honor, I object. Irrelevant. Sustained. We have heard testimony that you were seen holding Father O'Neill's hand in public. Is that true? I cut my finger and he was looking at it. You gave him an expensive gift, didn't you? No. No, I, I didn't. I call your attention to People's Exhibit 4. Do you recognize this uh, letter written by Father Thomas O'Neill to you? No. Sister Margaret, we have the testimony of a handwriting expert. This was written by Father O'Neill. 
Would you like to reconsider your testimony? Sergeant Brock showed that letter to me, and that was the very first time that I saw it. This was addressed to you. This was found in your room, and yet you're saying you never received it? That's right. You want us to believe you didn't get this note? You want us to believe you didn't give him the gift, Sister Margaret? Isn't it true you were in love with Father O'Neill? I object. This is irrelevant. Your Honor, Mr. Mason and his client have opened the door to this line of questioning. Your Honor, the prosecutor's questions exceed the scope of direct examination. I loved Father O'Neill. Oh. And you had an affair? No. Really? Sister Margaret, didn't you just testify that you visited his room on more than one occasion? Yes, but I... Please, Sister Margaret, yes or no? Wasn't that your testimony? Yes, but you make it seem as if when I When you went... got the note terminating the relationship, didn't you go to his room? He called me and he said... Yes or no, Sister Margaret? Yes. Thank you. Didn't you beg him to take you back, yes or no? No. Didn't he tell you the relationship had to come to an end? Yes, but the relationship... Isn't it true there was a fight? No. And in the fight, didn't your jacket get ripped? No. And the crucifix torn from your neck? No. Sister Margaret, isn't it true you were Father O'Neill's lover? No. He rejected you? No. You killed him. true no further questions there's someone else on trial here someone whose voice can never be heard father thomas o'neill was a good and an honest priest and there's not a person in this courtroom who can question his integrity He never broke his vows with me. I never broke mine with him. Counselor, your next witness. Your Honor, may I have a minute with my associate? One minute. Get her here as fast as you can. Mr. Mason? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I uh, call Mrs. Ellen Cartwright to the stand. Mrs. Cartwright, you are the administrator of St. Mark's Hospital, is that correct? Yes. Is your job there your sole source of income? Yes. Don't you have any investments? Few. Would one of them be the Centurion Ambulance Service? Yes, I have uh, some money in that company. Centurion serves a number of hospitals, does it not? Yes. And one of them is your hospital, St. Mark's? Yes. Mrs. Cartwright, isn't it true that you and your partners are the sole owners of the Centurion Ambulance Service? I really don't see what the... Please, just answer the question. Yes, it's true. One last question. And Mrs. Cartwright, I remind you, you are under oath. Now, who is your partner in the Centurion Ambulance Service? Dr. 
Peter Lattimore. Your witness? No questions. Dr. Lattimore, you are a partner in the Centurion Ambulance Service, is that correct? Yes, I am. You are also the chief of medicine at St. Mark's Hospital, is that correct? Yes. Last Friday night, in the emergency room of St. Mark's Hospital, did you treat Paul Drake for a gunshot wound? Yes, I did. How did you happen to be at the hospital at that hour? Were you on call? No. Were you looking after a patient? I don't remember. It may have been a post-op. Dr. Lattimore, weren't you at a restaurant with friends and weren't you called to the phone by your service? I don't remember. Didn't you rush out without finishing your dinner? I said I don't remember. Doctor, do you usually treat patients in the emergency room? No. Yet you sent the young resident, Dr. Williams, away and treated Paul Drake yourself? Yes. Did you examine his wound? Yes. What was the indicated treatment? It was superficial. I had the nurse bandage it up. Was any medication required? Only what was necessary to cleanse the wound. Doctor, are you familiar with the drug potassium chloride? Of course I am. Could you describe its usage? It's used for um, irregular heart rhythms, fainting, particularly for people on diuretics. But if administered in a large enough dose, it would induce cardiac arrest and would be fatal. Yes. And in a fatal dose, would be almost impossible to detect by autopsy. Yes. Dr. Lattimore, would there have been any reason to give this drug to Paul Drake? No. Now, if I were to show you a syringe from St. Mark's Hospital, taken from the emergency bay after you treated Paul Drake, wouldn't it be filled with a fatal dose of potassium chloride? I don't know. Dr. Lattimore, isn't it true you received a phone call from someone who ordered you to the hospital to kill Paul Drake? Your Honor... Isn't it true that the person who called you knew you embezzled money from the hospital for your investments, including the Centurion Ambulance Service? Multiple and Isn't it true that the person who called you ordered Logan... Mr. Mason! Jefferson ...to kill Father O'Neill? Mr. Mason! This court will come to order. Mr. Rustin, your objections are sustained. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. But I would like to reserve the right to recall this witness to the stand. Mr. Reston? I have no questions at this time. Step down. I call Miss Gladys Terry. Miss Terry. Please tell the court where you work. The medical phone service. We're the city's oldest answering service for doctors. Do you handle Dr. Lattimore's calls? Yes, sir, we do. Can you tell me if he received a call at approximately 10 o'clock last Friday night? If he did, it'll be right in here. Your Honor, Paul Drake was shot at Logan's Hotel by Logan's Confederate. Only the person who shot him could have called Dr. Lattimore and told him to finish the job. Now, Miss Terry, what did you find? At 10.30 Friday night, Dr. Lattimore received a call from a gentleman who said it was an emergency. We put him through. And who was that gentleman? Mr. Jonathan Eastman. 
Your witness. No questions. You may step down. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to recall Dr. Peter Lattimore to the stand. All right. We embezzled the money together, and each one was our partner. But he had the priest killed, O'Neill. It was all his idea. He did. People move for a dismissal. Case dismissed. All rise. bench. Thank you, Counselor. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. Now, remember, you heard it here first. You are right. I am the most obstinate woman that you have ever met. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. As soon as I can, I'll come down to L.A. I'd like that. Thanks, Perry. Well, let's see. I've been half frozen. I've been shot. Missed my trip to Tahiti. And what do I get? Thanks. <laughs> For a boat ride with someone we didn't know. I just don't know. I was so paralyzed with fear that I couldn't do anything to help him. I, I just watched. Let's go. Billy, please, I can't. Sure you can. Sure you can. I'll be right there with you, just like I promised. Please, Billy. Sarah? I don't want to do this. Sarah, don't make me force you. I can't. <gasps> She's dead. She's dead. It's been over 15 years. you got to let go of it. Come on. All right. Was it around here that it happened? Okay. Now I want you to take the wheel, just like you did then. No, Billy. Come on, Sarah. No, take I it. can't. Sarah, take the wheel.
Okay. Can you see what I'm doing here? All right. You see that? It's up to you. You take the wheel, or we're both dead. It's up to you. Celebrate. I want champagne. Lots of champagne. You wanna go uh you wanna go down to the city or you wanna go to the lodge? The lodge. That way we'll be closer to home after dinner and we can build the fire in yeah. our room. Yeah. That sounds great. <gasps> oh, Billy. I've never been so happy. Oh, and they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> ah. Hey. Come to think of it, even you aren't too sure. Ah, I was just afraid you'd miss the limelight, all those groupies on the circuit. Well, those groupies, they were kind of nice. Oh, oh, okay, very nice. No, they weren't nice. They weren't nice. I'm a has-been. I'm an official tennis bum. My groupie days are long gone. You better be, because I ain't ever letting go of you. And a boy, Billy! like you made a real woman out of her. What are you doing home so early? I thought you were at work. Well, I'm resigning. I'm not cut out to be a mining executive. But if you and Billy swing that deal to start a ski resort, you let me know. I think that's more my speed. It could be a long time from now, Skip. Hey, I'm in no hurry. I'm not going anywhere. Yes, you are, Skip. I thought we agreed if you work for the company, you'll be paid a regular salary. You can even stay here until you can find a place of your own, but you just can't live here with us indefinitely. Is that any way to treat family? There's not that many of us left, Cousin Sarah. Lay off. I suppose I have you to thank for these new regulations, huh, Billy Boy? It's Sarah's decision. Right. for me to do that. You sure you want to do this? Positive. Okay. Hey, looks like the hooks are still on the wall. I should make it a snap. Yeah. Okay, that's got it. Okay, that looks level to me. Level to you. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Hans. You sure you're all right? It's just going to take a little getting used to, that's all. How are you feeling now, Walter? Well, I suppose there's nothing like a high-priced surgeon poking around in your heart to remind you that you're mortal, just like everybody else. <laughs> oh, you are mortal, all right. That disposition of yours hasn't gotten any better since the day I got out of law school and you gave me my first job. What's with the cane? That is your fault. 
When I missed seeing you up here the last time, I went skiing, hence the knee and the cane. But it's going to be fine. Good. Gentlemen. Uncle Walter. I am not your uncle, young lady. I let you try my patience out of choice, not family tie. Perry Mason, I'd like you to meet my ward, Sarah Wingate Travis. Mr. Mason, I heard you were coming to Uncle Walter's retirement party this weekend. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I'd like you to meet my husband, Billy Travis. Yes, hello. Hello. Oh. I remember seeing you a couple of years back at Forest Hills. Did I win or did I lose? You won. Must have been an early round. Never made it past the quarterfinals there. Nice to meet you. Well, Billy's given up tennis for resort development. You look lovely tonight, Sarah. Thank you. You're a lucky man, Billy. I know. Very nice meeting you both. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> May I take your cane? Yes, thank you. Dinner has already been ordered. Perry, you remember Sarah Wingate? That girl has been through a lot. For a time, most of us wondered if she'd ever recover. Indeed, there were certain people who wanted to have her institutionalized. She seems fine now, quite happy. Thanks to Billy. Though everybody else around here thinks he only married her for the Wingate money. Oh, that's the first thing you ever taught me. Don't go with the crowd. Form your opinion based on fact. I haven't changed. The duck is perfect here, so I ordered fish. And that is a fact. Ah. Oh. You want another one? Yeah. Let's have another one. Yes, sir. Okay. What are we celebrating now? How about each other? Okay. Really? Lisa. Oh. Mr. Travis would like another bottle of champagne. How cover for me, huh? This one's special delivery. How are you tonight, Mr. Travis? I'm fine, thanks. And uh, so is the wine. Excuse me. Well, aren't you going to try it? I, uh, I already have. Look, why don't you just leave the bottle? I'll pour it myself. Sure. Should I be jealous? Of Lisa? That was a long, long time ago. You don't have to be jealous of anybody. Okay? I hope it's not too late. I've got some checks in here that need to be signed right away. Doc, can't wait until morning. Man, it's government stuff. You know, if we don't get them out right away, they'll be paying some pretty stiff penalties. You know, why is it always the last minute? You're the one that's got Sarah Co signing all the checks. Nothing but time and extra trouble. Well, you'll get used to it. Oh, Billy, it's all right. It's all right. Excuse me, Mr. Travis. Your brother called a few minutes ago. He'd like you to call him back. Where is he? The bar at the lodge. Excuse me, honey. I'll get into the study. How are you, Sarah? I've never been happier, Doug. I thought you said something about needing some signatures. Yeah. You're not going to let him do it, are you? Do what? Sell the mine. Skip said Billy had you talked into getting out of the business altogether. You'll have to talk to Billy about that. 
And that'll mean new management. What happens to me? I interrupt something? Yeah. Listen, honey, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to go on for a little while. What does Frank want this time? Nothing, really. We'll talk about it later, okay? Are you going to be all right? Yeah, I'll be fine. Doug's leaving now, too. Do you want me to wait up for you? Well, it's going to take a little while, but sure, I want you to wait up for me. Mm. I never would have gone out and left you here alone like that. Good night, Doc. Got your tea ready. woman bartender at the lodge, Lisa Blake. What's the gossip in the village about her? Oh, I don't pay any attention to gossip. Yes, you do. What are they saying? Oh, nothing much, really. It's about her and Mr. Travis, isn't it? Now, you know it's all a lie, Sarah. Please. What are they saying about her and Billy? Well, they're saying how friendly they are. About how they're always laughing and joking together. But I was in the pharmacy yesterday and I looked out the window and I saw Mr. Travis talking to her. And they weren't laughing or joking. They seem, well, sort of serious and quiet. Thank you. Shall I wait up for Mr. Travis? No. That's all right. You go to bed. Good night, Sarah. Good night. All I need is enough to get Manny off my back for a little while. I know I can make this new deal work. I know it. Frank, it sounds great. It's just that I can't come up with that kind of money. I'm not asking you for a handout. You know me. I've never done that. But, uh... Look. You're my brother. I got no one else I can go to on this thing. I'm sorry, Frank. I just can't do it. All right, look, I can come up with a couple thousand cash, but you're into Manny and those gamblers for big bucks. Now, I just can't get it from Sarah again. You could if you wanted to. I put the best part of my life into teaching you how to handle yourself, showing you the ropes, managing your tennis career. Doesn't that count for anything now? No, I never told you this before, but you put the best part of your life in a shot glass. Or the poker games. Or the ponies. Frank, man, I'm, I'm sorry, but things are different now, you know? I'm married. Sarah's got to come first. I just don't know what else I can tell you. How about goodbye? <laughs> He'll be back. Frank's like me. He always comes back. What's that? Margarita. Just the way I used to make them for you in Acapulco, remember? No, thanks. I don't drink those anymore. Maybe you forgot the taste. Mm. Oh, God. Sarah?
Sarah. Sarah, I know how hurt you're feeling. And I know how it looked. But you gotta believe me, it was her play, not mine. I'm really very tired, Billy. Can you please just go to sleep? I love you. Looking for your sister? This is where it all happened, isn't it? I know all about it. Now it's your turn.
call. She said there was some trouble. Sheriff, it's my wife. What happened? I don't know what happened, but she's out there somewhere. Dark, too cold, and too deep for him to find anything in that water. Isn't there anything we can do? A drag boat coming in this afternoon, but I don't expect they'll have much luck. Everybody knows this lake's reputation for not giving up its bodies. I don't think we'll ever find your wife, Mr. Travis. She's down there now, just like her sister. I got some questions for you. Like this handkerchief? These are your initials, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I also want to know how you got that blood on your pants there. I'll get it. Walter! Della. <laughs> Good to see you. Well, it's good to see you, too. And you. Walter, really, how do you feel? Well, I'm feeling fine, just fine. Just because I've had some minor surgery, Perry thinks he should take over this case. Since when does a triple bypass qualify as minor surgery? They're doing them every day. They're becoming as common as, uh, as root canal. Now, Walter, you know Perry's right. You're in no condition to take over a murder case. I figured you'd be taking his side. Seriously, Della, I'm glad you're here. If Perry's gonna try to fill in for me, he'll need all the help he can get. Though if you need me, I'll be in the intensive care ward. We'll be in touch with you. <laughs> Paul's downstairs checking us in. Did you call Billy Travis yet? I wanted to get all the background I could from Walter. How does it look? Uh, what about Billy? Could be better. A lot better. Good morning. Nice place. Should have brought my ski stuff. They already got snow on the higher elevations. Paul, you might not have time to go skiing for a while. Why's that? It's ought to be simple. First thing you have to do is call an old schoolmate friend of yours who lives near here. She says if you leave town without seeing her, she'll never forgive you. Then you can start checking these names. Skip Wingate, Douglas Vickers, Mrs. Constance Cheney, Frank Travis. Are, are they suspects? According to Walter, all of them had motive. All of them knew that Sarah was in the habit of going to the lake when she was troubled. All right, let's go talk to Billy. Perry, Walter is convinced that Billy couldn't have done it, isn't he? He is, as am I. For a moment there, she looked familiar. For a moment there, she was. Paul? Yeah. Mush. Did you recognize the caller's voice? No, I was still half asleep. I can't even tell you if it was a man or a woman. All I know is that they whispered words. You'll find 
Sarah in the lake. So you went to the lake? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know what to think. When I got there, I found her car was empty and her... her shoe and her scarf floating in the water. I didn't know. I... I didn't know. I thought maybe she... Suicide? Yeah. But the sheriff got there just in time to see you rowing to shore alone. But he also received an anonymous phone call from someone who was whispering. Look, I could never have hurt Sarah. Never. But somebody sure went out of their way to make it look like I did. Somebody, Billy. Now we're going to find that somebody. Division two of the Superior Court of Buckner County is now in session. The Honorable Howard J. McGraw presiding. Be seated and come to order. Does the defendant want a formal reading of the complaint, Mr. Mason? My client will waive a formal reading, Your Honor. Mr. Reston? That's fine with me, Your Honor. Very well, gentlemen. I'll set this for uh, Thursday the 21st. Do you have a bail motion, Mr. Mason? Why, yes, Your Honor. We, uh... Yes, well, Your Honor. The defendant has only lived in this jurisdiction for a number of months, and he has no ties sufficient to ensure his making his next court appearance. Mr. Mason? Your Honor, the prosecutor has accused my client of murdering his wife in order to acquire her rather substantial fortune. Using his own argument, it's not reasonable to assume that Billy Travis would now run away, thereby proving his guilt and throwing away millions of dollars. I'll set bail at $300,000, Mr. Mason. You can take care of the arrangements with my clerk. We're in recess. All rise. Yeah. I've uh, seen the evidence, Mr. Mason. You've drawn a losing card, I think. Game's not over yet, counsel. Not yet. Harry. Hey, I'm so glad I caught you. Here's the background material you wanted. Oh, Billy, this is Della Street. She runs my office. It's a pleasure to meet you. Billy Travis. Perry and I have watched you play many times. I'm just going to take Billy home. I'm not sure when I'll get back. Why don't you and Paul dig up what you can on the old kidnapping case? The old case? You think there's a connection between Sarah's disappearance and Amy's disappearance? I'm not quite sure what I think, but I am intrigued by the coincidence. We'll see you. Oh, you know, Paul, as soon as I have a chance, I want to get in touch with Vi. Who's Vi? Vi Denslow, my old school chum. Oh, 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 that Vi, yes. Do you remember? I always wanted you to meet her daughter, the librarian. The librarian? How exciting. <laughs> Stupid. Hey, look, this is empty. Better get some beers. Don't go away. Oh, look who's back. How was jail? How can you be partying at a time like this? Man, how can you show your face after what you did? You must be Mr. Wingate. My name's Mason. Oh, yeah. I heard you took the case from old man Hazlitt. I can't understand why. I'd be happy to explain it, if you have the time. I'm sorry. As you can see, I'm uh, wrapped up. Hi, this is 
is Mr. Mason. He'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Yes, what is it? The morning Mrs. Travis drove to the lake, did you see or hear any other cars around the property? No. But you did hear Mrs. Travis' car leaving? No. But the garage is right there. Surely the sound of a car Mrs. Started... Travis came back from the village that night and left the car out in front. I'm sorry, Mr. Travis. I was already in bed. I didn't go out to put it away. Hans. Yes? Your phone is ringing. Mrs. Hans? Has he been there yet? Yes, and asking questions. Well, there's nothing to worry about. I'll handle him. You just stay in your room. If anybody asks about me, you know nothing. Nothing, you understand? Sorry to intrude, Mrs. Cheney. I'm... You're Perry Mason, of course. So, what can I do for you? I understand you manage all the affairs pertaining to the estate. You pay the help, order the groceries. Yes. For the last ten years, ever since Mr. Wingate died. And Billy quoted Sarah as saying you've been in charge of everything since she and Amy were little girls. Well, little girls tend to exaggerate. Sarah said that just two weeks ago. What's your point, Mr. Mason? Well, Sarah recently took over those duties, didn't she? Mr. Mason, I've been with this family for 25 years. I raised those two little girls. They're the children I never had. Suddenly, I was no longer needed. Sarah didn't need me anymore. That was after she married Mr. Travis. Yes. Everything changed after he moved in with us. Those the financial records of the household accounts? Yes, just general maintenance, repairs, utilities, that sort of thing. I've been trying my best to make some sense out of it since Sarah... If you need help, you can call on me, Mrs. Cheney. There's going to be a general audit, you understand. Yes, of course. And now you'll have to excuse me, Mr. Mason. I have to see about dinner. Mr. Mason, did you find anything? Well, we made a start. Did you get in touch with your brother, Frank? No, I'm worried about him. You know, he's vanished before, but he's always stayed in touch with me. He owes a lot of money to people from Las Vegas. All right, Billy. We'll try to find him. Hopefully before they do. Hopefully before they do. No. Because I'm the one doing all the dirty work, taking all the chances, not you. Yeah? Yeah, well, that's how I'm playing it. And if you don't hold up your end, I may just have a few more surprises for you. Why should I tell you where I am? Yeah, that's right. I don't trust you. And if you try anything, I just may come after you, too. Keep you waiting so long that it couldn't be avoided. Isn't this unusual, working the mine these long hours? It is, but we're fighting for our lives here. If Billy Travis had it his way, he'd shut this mine down. Is that bad? Sure. New owners would lay men off or go non-union. And replace you. Mr. Mason, if Billy Travis gets away with this, a lot of people are going to be upset. I take it you don't approve of Billy Travis under any circumstances. 
They were just playing Sarah for a fool. Once she caught him at it, he killed her. But you're no fool, are you? Your becoming president of this company is quite a success story. I feel very fortunate that Mr. Wingate took a liking to me. He must have liked you a great deal. There's no secret he gave me my first big promotion out of gratitude. Gratitude? Well, I was one of the sheriff's posse that caught up with little Amy's kidnapper at Indian Peak. As a reward, he upped me to foreman. Seemed to take a personal interest in me. Started inviting me up to the house. The day he died was the saddest day of my life. I understand you also spent a good bit of time with Sarah. The girl was lonely, afraid her father was gone. And I felt sorry for her. Is that why you proposed to her? Who told you that? Proposed not once, but three times? That's nonsense. Who said that? Sarah told Billy. Billy! <laughs> Billy! You see, there you are. You know, I don't know why you come around here asking me questions when the man who murdered her is your own client. I got work to do. Mr. Vickers, is it true that before Billy came on the scene, you approached Walter Hazlitt with the idea of having Sarah committed? Yeah, you better watch your step on the way out, Mason. People have been known to take bad falls around here. I wouldn't worry about Frank Travis Drake. Gamblers have a way of showing up, either in a jail cell, a hospital bed, or a steel drawer in the morgue. I figure we'll find him one of those places sooner or later. Did you have a chance to look at the motels around here? First thing we did, both up in the village and down here in town. If he's still around, he's hiding under a rock someplace. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, Sheriff. Appreciate it. Great. One more thing. I suppose you get used to playing pretty fast and loose working for an important lawyer like Perry Mason. You get a line on Frank Travis, I want to know right away. You'll be the first to know. Thank you. Excuse me. You working? Well, it depends on where you want me to go. Well, you have to tell me. I got a couple hours to kill. And I'm looking for a place I can get a good steak, a decent drink, and maybe lay down a bed or two. Sorry, pal. There's no place like that in this town. Sure? Not if you want all three, but if you don't mind lousy food and weak drinks, I know where you can lay down a bed on anything that runs, kicks, hits, or dribbles. Last place lounge. Well, I'll check it out. Uh, here, thanks for the tip. Stock again, huh? Hi. Hi. Bye. Bye. What's this? Copies of newspaper clippings on the kidnapping case. Is all you could find? Well, that's all there was in the village library. But tomorrow I'm going to go in and check the city's newspaper morgue. Good idea. The papers around here should have been full of this case. It's a long time ago. It is quite a story, though, isn't it? Missing body cases are like that. They never seem to go away. Did, uh, did they ever catch the kidnapper? He was killed in a gun battle. Oh. Well, Perry, I have this theory. If the kidnapper were still alive, maybe he had something to do with Sarah's murder. I don't think I believe that history repeats itself. But I do believe that sometimes people try to repeat history. What if he didn't work alone? What if he had help? An accomplice? Mm -hmm. Maybe the accomplice planned all this. It's an interesting thought. By the way, did we hear from Walter this afternoon? No, there were no messages. Please call and ask him for a copy of Sarah's will. I want to see you how the estate... You want to see how the estate will be divided. Why, yes. Frank. 
think? What? That guy. He's watching you. Who? Him. Is that Manny the guy who's after you? No. Haven't you got something you gotta go do? Frank, I just got here. Go fix your face, okay? Okay. It's a good idea, Frank. <laughs> Listen, uh, listen, I know that Manny is really mad, okay? Just just give me a chance to explain, okay? Well, I'm not going anywhere. Look, look I, I just need a little more time, that's all. Look, everybody knows I'm good for my marker, huh? And Manny's gonna get every cent that I owe him. I mean... Frank, it. Frank, you don't want to call on a con, man. Now, where are you gonna come up with that kind of money? Not me, my brother. <laughs> my brother has got a lock on millions. Now, I heard... That your brother was going to be doing time for a murder rap. No, 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 no way. No way, no. They'll never convict him without a body. And they're never going to find a body, believe me. Did you know something? Hey, man. Well, why don't you tell me so I can explain it to Manning? Hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, but not here. Um, yeah, why don't I buy you dinner? Huh? What about your girlfriend? <laughs> that airhead? <laughs> I was gonna shake her anyway. How about Chinese? Do you like Chinese? I know a place that's got primo Chinese. I like Chinese. No tricks. <laughs> well, I promise, okay? Look, uh, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm tired. I've been running and hiding, and I'm tired. I, I, in a way, I'm glad you caught up with me. In a way, I'm glad I caught up with you, too. Come on, let's go. Yeah. see Mrs. Travis when she came back here that night? Yep. I was right behind her when she came in and caught her husband and Lisa in the middle of a kiss. Had Billy come here to meet with Miss Blake? No. He'd been talking with his brother Frank. Seems that they had some sort of argument and Frank got all mad and rushed out. Next thing I saw was Lisa planning a big one on Mr. Travis. What you're saying is it was Miss Blake who kissed Billy. It sure is the way it looked to me. I'd like to talk to her. What time does she come to work? She doesn't. Not anymore. Since when? She called in about 11 o'clock the next day. Said her mother was sick and she was going home to take care of her. Now, was there a particular man in Miss Blake's life? Come to think of it, no. Lisa liked to work all the fellas that came in here. A lot of them tried to date her, but I never saw her go out with any of them. I always had the impression, though, that there was somebody she was seeing. Thank you for your time. If you should hear from her, I'd appreciate your letting me know. Sure thing, Mr. Mason. Thanks.
You miss it? You know, sometimes I play old matches over and over again in my head when I was sleeping. Guess it'll always be a part of me. Have you given up playing? That too. Two operations on this shoulder. It was worse than when I first wrecked it. I'm sorry to hear that. Dylan said you were looking for me. Mr. Mason, I got a call from Frank this morning. Well, did he say where he was? No, he wouldn't tell me. All I could get from him was that some leg breaker from Las Vegas almost caught up with him last night. This guy must have scared Frank pretty bad. He said he was going to get lost for a little while. Did Frank ever spend any time with Lisa Blake? Frank and Lisa? Why? What are you thinking? Well, she seems to have left town just about the time Frank dropped out of sight. How long has Frank known Lisa? We both met Lisa in Acapulco when I was there for a tournament. That was uh, five or six years ago. She'd show up around the circuit every now and then after that. But I always figured it was me she came to see on Frank. All right, what about you and Lisa? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Mason. I gave up Lisa and that whole world when I met Sarah. As far as I was concerned, Sarah and I... As far as I was concerned, Sarah and I were going to be married forever. I got to get going. Billy. Big mistake. You probably don't really want to see her, and she probably doesn't want to see you. Oh, that's ridiculous. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, here's a receipt for some car repairs I wound up with after last night. What repairs? Oh, hi, Perry. Just, uh, it's a little bill for four tires. Four tires? <clears throat> and a bumper. Perry, you're not going to believe this, but I caught up with Frank Travis last night. But? But, uh... I had a little accident and he got away. But I almost had him. I thought some leg breaker from Las Vegas almost had him. How'd you hear about that? Forget how I heard about that. Right now, it's more important that you find Elisa Blake. She was a bartender here at the lodge. How long has she been gone? She called in Tuesday morning about 11 with a lie about having to leave town. I'll be in touch. Mm -hmm. Tell him I'd like you to run a check on Lisa Blake. See what you can find out about her. Well, if it's all right, uh, could I do it right after lunch? Sure. Good. In fact, why don't you come along? I'm sure Vi would love to meet oh, you. Oh, I'm afraid she's not coming, Della. She left a message at the desk saying she'd explain everything later. I guess Paul was right. She really doesn't want to see me. That's not possible. It's not? Who wouldn't want to see you? Oh, oh, oh. Hello there. Can I help you? I certainly hope so, Mrs. Niff. Oh, call me Polly. <laughs> I bet you're with that Mr. Mason down at the lodge, aren't you? How do you know that? You must be Paul Drake, right? <laughs> you got it. You've heard of small town gossip? Well, we're no different here than any place else. <laughs> there, well, I feel good about coming in then. Why don't you stop soft soaping me, Paul? And tell me what it is you need. All right. I am trying to trace a call that came into the bar over at the lodge about 10 days ago. There's no way we can do that. Mm, I was afraid you were going to say that. What are you looking for? I'm trying to get a line on Lisa Blake. All the men around here say she makes a mean martini. All the women would like to swizzle her with a stick. Swizzle her with a <laughs> stick, okay? Wait a minute. When did you say that call came in? A week ago Tuesday. What time on Tuesday? 11 a.m.? I think you should try the town of Oakwood. What makes you say that? Well, the operator over there is a phone friend of mine. You know, we talk sometimes. But 
anyway, that Tuesday morning, she called trying to track down who it was that run out on $4.57 worth of overtime charges. It could have been Lisa Blake. All right. Thank you very much. You are terrific. Of course I am. <laughs> so you think he did it? Who? Billy Travis. You think he killed Sarah? Well, you know, I'm not allowed to comment on a case that I'm working on. Well, you don't have to, because I think he's as guilty as he can be. He killed her for the money and then tried to make it seem like she'd had an accident or committed suicide. Well, you may be right. Of course I'm right. I'm a good judge of men. I've been married four times. <laughs> Is that all? Okay, thanks a lot. The operator's name is Loretta. I'll call and tell her you're coming. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa Blake, take a look at the second page. Two years for assault with intent to commit murder. Don't get in touch with the prison officials or parole officer. Any friends she had at the time, we can connect with one I've of them. I've already started on it. Frank would show up for this. Why didn't he? You're still thinking he's involved in this with Lisa. All rise. Division two of the Superior Court of Buckner County is now in session. Hey there. You own this place? That's right. You want to buy it? Make you a good price. Oh, well, I have to think about that. It's lovely, though. Pretty view. Bet you see about everything that goes on up here, don't you? Yeah, what little there is. Say, you wouldn't happen to be from the highway department uh, about the new interstate, would you? No, actually, I'm a, a representative for the phone company. See this booth over here? We're losing a lot of money on it, and I'm trying to find out who's responsible. Lots of people use that phone. Well, I'm looking for someone in particular. Made a phone call about a week ago, Tuesday, about 11 a.m. Hard to say. Well, you wouldn't be able to miss this person. Pretty girl, about five foot six. Wild red hair, drives a beat up Land Cruiser, I believe. Yeah, hey, I think I know the one you mean. Not exactly the type you find hanging around an oil spot in a road like this. She's still around here? Well, at least she was a couple hours ago. Came in and bought a few things. Huh. Is she alone? Yes. But I've been noticing she's buying two of most things, you know, TV dinners. Wouldn't have to know where I could find her, would you? Well, I'd try one of those places down the highway if I was you. Uh, there's three or four of them. All right, I'll do that. Thank you very much Ever for your time. Ever in the market for a grocery store, let me know. Could be a lot of action around here once the new interstate comes through. I'll keep that in mind. Now, Sheriff, I show you People's Exhibit Number 5, Man's Handkerchief. You seen it before? Yes, sir. One of my deputies found it hidden under a pile of leaves just back of where the defendant was parked at the lake. Were you able to establish ownership of this handkerchief? I was. There's a monogram on it with the defendant's initials. We traced it to the store in the village where he bought it. Your Honor, for the record, this handkerchief is covered with dried blood stains. The record will so reflect, Mr. Rice. Thank you. Sheriff, were you able to determine the source of the blood stains? Yes, sir. Laboratory analysis showed it to be human blood type B negative. The same blood type as the victim, Sarah Travis. That's correct. 
Thank you. Sheriff? Could you identify for me, please, for the record, People's Exhibits numbers 6 and 7? And number 6 is a scarf belonging to the victim that was found in the defendant's possession the morning his wife disappeared. The bloodstains on this scarf, are they similar to those on the handkerchief? They are. And People's Exhibit 7, this pair of pants worn by the defendant on that morning. The bloodstains on this pair of pants, are they similar to the stains on the scarf and the handkerchief? They are. Thank you, Sheriff. For the record, I show you People's 8. Can you identify it? It's a woman's shoe we found in the rowboat just after the defendant had rowed ashore. And were you able to determine who it belongs to? Yes, sir. It's the left shoe of a pair specially ordered for the victim by a store in the village. Thank you, Sheriff. No further questions. That's all true. Their truth, Billy. But we also have your truth. Sheriff Prine, you watched Mr. Travis as he rode back to shore, did you not? Yes, sir. Could you describe for us his style or... Uh manner of rowing? Well, I'd kind of call it uh, kind of crab-like. Crab-like? Meaning what? Well, as I recollect, he was rowing mostly with one arm, the, the left one, I believe, uh, while with his right, he was sort of stabbing at the water. Far from being rhythmic or smooth, his technique was Unusual, to say the least. Yes, it was. Thank you, Sheriff Prine. No further questions. She's pretty strange when all right. Barely comes out at all during the day, and she won't let my wife go near the place to clean it up. She's number 10 there. I'm about ready to throw her out. She's way behind her rent. Is she alone? She's got some fella in there with her. Wouldn't happen to be Frank Travis, would it? I don't know. I don't ask too many questions. What's he look like? I really never did get a good look at him. A couple of times I did see anything. All I caught was the back of his brown leather jacket. You're done. You run her off, and I'm out a whole week's rent. And I had just started to scan the valley with my binoculars when I saw a small boat heading out onto the lake. Could you see who was in that boat? No, sir. I was too far away for that. But I could see that the person rowing was in a hurry. And the other person? Seemed to be lying back in the boat. About what time was this? Maybe 5.45, 5.50, no later. That's roughly half an hour before the phone call that Mr. Travis claims to have received. Objection. Argumentative. Sustained. Anything else, Mr. Reston? No, nothing further, Your Honor. Your witness, Mr. Mason. You just testified that you saw someone rowing, but you couldn't see who it was. Isn't that correct? That's right. I was too far away. And that person appeared to be in a hurry. Yes, that's right. And the rower's style. Could you see whether it was smooth, even, choppy? Objection. Your Honor, so far the relevancy of this line of questioning has eluded counsel for the people. <laughs> Overruled for now. But let's keep it moving, Mr. Mason. You may answer, sir. Yes, there was a smoothness and rhythm to the movement I saw. Thank you. Nothing further. You may step down. With the court's indulgence, a defense witness is in the hallway. And because of his surgical schedule, he's only able to testify today. I ask that he be permitted to testify out of order, Your Honor. Mr. Reston? People are always interested in variety, Your Honor. No objections. 
Call your witness, Mr. Mason. What is your present position, Dr. Everett? I am chief of orthopedic surgery at Valley Central Hospital. The defendant, Mr. Travis, is a patient of yours, is he not? He is. Doctor, please tell us when you first saw Mr. Travis and why you saw him. Approximately three years ago, he came to me for treatment of a severely damaged rotator cuff. That injury nearly ended his tennis career, did it not? Absolutely. His shoulder is one of the worst I've ever seen. After several therapies, two surgeries, we could see no improvement whatsoever. And his condition for the past, say, six months? A substantial nerve damage, deterioration. Uh, his range of motion in his right arm is less than 30%. In your experience as an orthopedist, and with your knowledge of the condition of Mr. Travis, right shoulder, do you have an opinion on his ability to have smoothly and forcefully rowed a small boat during the past six months or at the time of this alleged murder? Yes, I do. What is that opinion? He could not. Absolutely not? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Thank you, doctor. That's all. Yes, I can call in and let you know where I am more often. Right now, I'm down in Oakwood. Perry, you're not going to believe this, but I caught up with Lisa Blake. And the car? I don't think you'd call it damage. I just lost the distributor cap, but I'm having a new one sent over. What else? Lisa's been checked into a motel here since the day of Sarah's death. And there seems to be someone with her. A guy in a brown leather jacket. And that is who? No, I'm guessing it's Frank Travis, but I'm not sure now. Why not? Perry, I found a hairbrush they left behind in the room. It's engraved with the name Amy Wingate. The same Amy who's been dead for 15 years. Paul, go back to the motel before they clean that room. We need a complete forensic examination. You got it. Mrs. Cheney said you want to see me, Mr. Mason? What's it about? Lisa Blake. You and Lisa Blake. Me? <laughs> you got the wrong guy. Sure, I noticed her, but I uh, haven't had time to get around to her yet. Is that right? You have quite a reputation as a ladies' man. You know, you're wasting your time. Everybody knows Billy married my cousin for her money. And he's the only one that has anything going on with Lisa. Now he's going to be convicted of murder. Which would agree with you mightily, wouldn't it? Is there a law against that? There is a law against murder. <laughs> you don't seriously believe that I did it, do you? You had motive. If Billy were to be convicted, you stand to inherit the lion's share of Sarah's estate. What about Mrs. Cheney? What about you, Mr. Wingate? Forget it, Mason. I was nowhere near the lake that morning. And I have companions who will swear to it. If Lisa Blake was your accomplice, you could have been on another planet. This little talk is over. Why don't you just get out of here? Just get out! Excuse me. Is there a problem here, Mr. Mason? No, no, no. Mr. Wingate was just bidding me good night. Good night. On that Tuesday, the morning of the 12th, the morning that Sarah Travis disappeared, were you at the Wingate house? Yes. With the exception of days off, I've been there every day for nearly a quarter of a century. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Mrs. Cheney. Uh, at what time in the morning do you normally rise? 6.30 sharp. 
I have an alarm clock, but I never need it. Is there a phone in your room? Of course there is. At around 6.15 that morning, Mr. Travis claims that he received an anonymous telephone call. Did you hear the phone ring that morning? I did not. Did you hear the phone ring at any time between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. that morning? I did not. I'm a very light sleeper, Mr. Reston. If the phone had rung, I would have heard it. I'm positive it didn't ring. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Cheney. No further questions. Ms. Cheney, is the telephone in your bedroom an extension of the estate's main phone line? It is. Are there any telephones just for intercommunication on the estate, not connected to that main number? I really don't know. Oh, Mrs. Cheney, you manage the estate, you pay the phone bills, don't you? Yes, but I could hardly be expected to remember every detail. Mrs. Cheney, is there a telephone in the caretaker's room? I believe so, yes. But it's an intercom line only, isn't it? There's no outside line. Objection, Your Honor. There is no foundation for this question, and even if there is, it wouldn't be relevant. I want to see where Mr. Mason's going with this. Proceed. You weren't in your own room that morning, were you, Mrs. Cheney? Well, of course I was. Isn't it true that you have an established pattern in your life? You leave your room at night after everyone's asleep? Leave my... Well, certainly not. Isn't it true that having left your room, you spend the remainder of the night in the caretaker's room? Order. Order. No. Isn't it true that you could not have heard the phone ring? Because the phone in Mr. Bruck's room is not connected to the outside line. Order. Order. All right. I was there, and I couldn't have heard the phone ring if it rang. to call me hours ago. Where was he when you last heard from him? Well, he was headed north. All rise. <laughs> Continuing with the people versus Travis. Be seated. Uh, Your Honor, due to a pressing problem with an associate of mine, I'd like to request a recess until tomorrow. Mr. Reston? Uh, the prosecution has no objection, Your Honor. 
Court will adjourn till 9 a.m. tomorrow. He was headed north out of Fairview. But, Perry, that was at the crack of dawn. I'm on my way. It's far. Is he all right? I don't know. Go a little slower, will you please? The man at the gas station was positive Paul took this road. Hold it. There's no sign of any concussion. Thank you, Doctor. Morning. You're free to go at any time. Thanks, Doc. See? Told you all I needed was a good night's sleep, a hot shower, and I am ready to go find Lisa. I certainly hope you find her. Well, when I left the road yesterday, she was screaming up Route 118. You know where 118 goes? It dead ends up in the foothills. I have a very strong suspicion that Lisa is hiding out up there. I'd like to go with you, but I have to be back in court at 9 this morning. All I need is a car. Take mine. How are you going to get back? Oh, I'll figure something out. But to get back faster if you're going to make it by 9. I got the forensic report on the items you found in the motel room. Let me tell you something. You better get back fast. Can't be too many places they'd be staying. Just a couple of line shacks, old burned out cabin, all that's up there. All right. Thanks for your time.
this what you're looking for? What do you want? I brought you a gift. Subpoena. I'm not even going to give you a lift to court. It's over. It's over. It's over. Come on. Let's go talk to your friend. It is now 9.45 a.m., and defense counsel has made no effort to even contact the court, nor is his associate, Ms. Street, able to suggest why the court's time is being wasted in this manner. given up on you. I did that years ago. I beg the court's pardon for my tardiness, but hope to show why it couldn't be helped. I'm sure we're all very curious to learn why it couldn't be helped, Mr. Mason. You may proceed. After you. I call Skip Wingate. <coughs> Mr. Wingate, how old were you when your cousin Amy disappeared in the lake? I was about 19. You informed the authorities that the kidnapper, James Maisley, had been lurking around the estate earlier, isn't that right? Yes, I guess so. <clears throat> In one of the first newspaper stories, you're quoted as saying there were two men, that Maisley had an accomplice. Come on, it was a long time ago. Would you like to look at that to refresh your memory? No. No, I... I was just confused. In all the excitement, I thought there were two guys. I was wrong. You're positive of that now, even retrospectively. Yeah, I'm positive. Your Honor, I object. I fail to see any hint of relevance in the past crime to the one before us now. Your Honor, counsel has stated precisely the point I intend to make that it's not mere coincidence that Sarah Travis disappeared in the same waters as her twin sister, that there is indeed a strong connective link between the past crime and this one. Overruled. I'd like to see if Mr. Mason can really make such a connection. Mr. Wingate, you were enrolled as a sophomore in the Colorado School of Mines at the time of the attempted kidnapping. That's right, but I left. Would you please tell the court why? I was, um, upset over what happened to Amy. Isn't it true that you dropped out of school because you were failing virtually every single one of your classes? I intended to go back and make up those grades. I just never got around to it. You never got around to it because you went to work for your uncle's mining company. Yes. I got a good job. But not from your uncle, isn't that so? All right, yes. Let's see. You were 20 years old. You had virtually no experience. 
you failed all of those training classes, yet someone hired you as a research and development consultant. I was hired to do the best I could, and I did. The real truth is that there was no job. What are you talking about? Weren't you, in fact, being paid for your silence about the kidnapper's connection with someone at Epic Mining? No, no. Isn't it true that you withheld information at the time of Amy Wingate's death? Well, isn't it? Mr. Wingate, I direct you to answer, or I'll hold you in contempt of court. I had nothing to do with what happened to Sarah. That does not answer the question. It was 15 years ago. I don't remember. Don't be ridiculous, Mr. Wingate. You have a marvelous memory. Now, who wanted their connection with the kidnapper kept quiet? Who? Vickers. Doug Vickers. Order. Order in this court. Thank you. I call Douglas Vickers. Mr. Vickers, you authorized those payments to Mr. Wingate, did you not? I did, but not for the reason you're inferring. It was good politics for me to give the kid a job. He flunked out of school. His uncle didn't know what to do with him, so uh, I gave him a job. Didn't Mr. Wingate see you with the kidnapper, James Maisley, on more than one occasion? All right, I, I knew Maisley. He kept hounding me for a job at the mine, but that's as far as my relationship went with him. A relationship you kept hidden by paying off Mr. Wingate. You blame me? I needed the job. Tying me to Maisley would have meant my being fired. Or worse. But I had nothing to do with the kidnapping. Mr. Vickers, you were a reserve deputy sheriff at the time, isn't that correct? Yes. And when the hunt was on for Maisley, you joined the posse. It was my duty. You, in fact, were one of three men who tracked Maisley down to where he was hiding in the mountains. That's correct. When Maisley was cornered, did he make any effort to surrender? Not that I could see. Apparently, there were different accounts of what happened that day, the day Mr. Maisley was shot. Do you remember the other two men who were with you? Look, Mason, I know what they said, and I know what I saw. I went through all of this with the sheriff and was cleared. So James Maisley was silenced and never lived to reveal the name of any accomplice he might have had. Your Honor, the court knows I have been patient, but I see no reason that this clearly irrelevant line of questioning should continue. I agree. The court is sustaining the objection. Let's move on, Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, may I have a moment? Very well. Mr. Vickers, as president of the Epic Mining Company, to what would you attribute the company's declining fortunes? A number of uh, economic factors. We're no different from any other mine in the state. Business is just plain bad. Bad? Does the word bad accurately describe large financial discrepancies and misappropriation of company funds? I don't know what you're talking about. The accounting firm of Harriman and Greenleaf would know, wouldn't they? They were the firm hired by Sarah Travis to prepare a financial statement for the company's possible sale. I haven't seen the statement. I'm sure you will in due time. As would the mine's owner, Sarah Travis, if she were here today. Her intention was to sell the mine, wasn't it? There was some talk. That would have meant an examination of the company records. It would have meant losing your job. You didn't want that to happen, did you, Mr. Vickers? You're saying I had reason to kill Sarah? That's exactly what I'm saying. And if you did kill her, you had an accomplice, Lisa Blake. I don't know anyone by that name.
Isn't it true Billy Travis arranged a job interview at your office last October for Lisa Blake? Mr. Mason, I interview a lot of people. Maybe, but this one was a little different. Mr. Vickers, didn't you arrange for her to get a job at the lodge? No. Isn't it true that you and Lisa plotted to murder Sarah Travis and frame her husband because they intended to close down the mine? That's not true. Isn't it true that on the night before her disappearance, Sarah and Billy Travis had a quarrel brought on by the actions of Lisa Blake? I wouldn't know. Isn't it true you then instructed Lisa to lay in wait for Sarah Travis all night if necessary? No. Isn't it true that Lisa was to murder Sarah and dump her body in the lake? to foster the romantic notion that history was repeating itself. I tell you, no! Order! 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 Mr. Vickers, isn't it true that Lisa Blake failed to carry out your instructions because of greed? She wanted more money from you, and finally she had to change the plan. Finally, she had to change your plan. You can't prove a word of this. I think I can. Sarah. What about me, Vickers? You got me into this. Sarah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for yes, any of Yes, you the... did. You wanted Sarah Travis dead. Shut up. You wanted me to kill her. Do that. Shut up! Get around here! Sarah, get around here! Get these people out of here! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! I believe the Honorable District Attorney should end this by moving for a dismissal of all the charges against Mr. Travis. Uh, that motion, Mr. Prosecutor, is granted. The defendant is ordered released herewith. Case dismissed. Thank you. We're so glad you're all right. Look who's here. Oh, bye. Oh, it's been so long. <laughs> Paul, I'd like for you to meet my good friend, Vi Denslow. Hello. How do you do? And this is her daughter, Melissa. Can we have dinner tonight? I'd love it. I'll call you as soon as I get back from taking Melissa to the airport. Airport? Back to work in Boston. Boston? Mm -hmm. I'll call. I'll call, too. Well, I guess that just leaves us. <laughs> what could be nice? Oh, oh, I almost forgot. The ski lodge will be open in a couple months. You're invited. Ah, skiing. <laughs> oh, no. Perry's given up skiing.